Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick Gard, and with me, as always, are three people who spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he is the author of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th, 25th century love story, and the Shish Roji to my Kambai. My right-hand man and partner in crime, Chris Haley. And welcome, Chris. Banzai, Patrick. <laughs> Also with, also with us is the woman whose attention we are always competing for, except when it comes to musical films, Lori Flores. Sayonara. Oh, wait, that's goodbye. <laughs> yeah, that's you're about gone already. Finally, the youngest member of our group and the man who is best described as a podcast equivalent of Katsushiro, Matt Palmer. I'm glad to bring this honor to your <laughs> podcast today. Okay, welcome, everybody. Uh, this week we're reviewing the... Classic film, foreign film from 1954, Seven Samurai. But before we get started, um, and you guys haven't, I'm kind of catching you guys a little bit off guard with this. Last month, Entertainment Weekly did something very unique, something very unusual. They ranked the top 100 films of all time, um, something we've been doing for a couple months now. But uh, to, in their defense, they've done it before. They do it every couple of years. But I was kind of curious where some of our films that we've reviewed so far rank in this if they rank at all and and what your thoughts are let's, let, and let's start with our first film Casablanca a film that we the four of us agreed was a, a seminal film to to review and that's why we wanted to start with a film like that although only three of us picked it in our top 100 I won't say who didn't pick it don't say it <laughs> but it's the only female <laughs> that's true doesn't like Humphrey Bogart films would you put? Do you believe it's on the list, and where would you think it's it's at? It's high. It's probably high. Matt, I I top three. Ooh, good guess, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I would put it at a top five. Ah, Casablanca, number three. Yeah. Uh, that was actually Citizen Kane, number one. Citizen Kane is number one. <laughs> and see, that's not one of my favorite movies either. Yeah, I I, I like Citizen Kane. I don't know if I'd put it in my top ten. Um, yeah, I I agree. It's there. It's iconic, and but. Not number one. Okay. Oh, it would be up there for me, though. All right. What about our second show, Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978? Is that the 78 version, Chris? Yeah. Okay. On the list? Uh, not on the list? Not, not on, the, on list. the list. Yeah, I don't think it's on the list. Uh, you guys would be correct. Not on the list. It does not make the list. Uh, then we were supposed to do Sing in the Rain, but I think we actually did Pulp Fiction because of the recording problem. So Pulp Fiction. On the list, not on the list. On the list, but maybe up in the above 50. Above 50 from Lori. Chris? I'm saying top 30. Top 30. Matt? Yeah, I'm going to say between um, 30 and 15. I don't oh. know if that's too too broad. Okay. Pulp Fiction is on the list. Number 19. Yay! Wow. Yeah. So Chris came closest there. Um, after Pulp Fiction, we did Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Uh, uniformly agreed upon by all four of us uh, as a top 100 film of all time. On the list or not on the list? On the list. Matt? I'm going to go not on the list. Okay. Cr Lori? You and I talked about it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did talk and to you about so it. So I, I, I'll be cheating, and, and I would have liked to have gotten ahead because I'm losing, but you told me it's not on the list. <laughs> not on the list. <laughs> film so far that we have uniformly agreed on is in the top 100, not on Entertainment Weekly's top 100 list. I was shocked. I was very surprised about that one. I like that film. You know what else is not on the list is Disney's Lone Ranger, so they must think they're all comparable. <laughs> yes. yes. They must be, as Lori likes to put it, at 101. 
at all times. You know? All of them. <laughs> okay, next film we reviewed was Singing in the Rain, uh, Laurie's first pick and the only musical we've re- reviewed so far. Uh, on top the list, five, baby. Top five on Lori's list. Is it on the Entertainment Weekly list? Lori? Yes. Chris? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Matt? I'm sure it's on there, and I'm sure it's high. Uh, you, unfortunately, would be right. Uh, Singing in the Raid, number 16. Yay! That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, then we went, oh, God, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'm not skipping one. McCabe and Mrs. Miller? Was uh, the next that one? sounds about right. Yep, McCabe and Mrs. Miller was the, uh, we went to another Western. Chris, your film, on the list, not on the list? Not on the list. Matt? No. Lori? I I don't think so. Okay, no, it didn't make the list. So. And then we had The Best Years of Our Lives, uh, another Lori pick, um, not a musical, thank God. Uh, on the list or not on the list? On the list. Matt? It's on the list. Chris? I'm kind of on the fence about it. I think it is, but it'll be pretty low, maybe towards the 90s or so. Where do you think it's at, Lori, if it's on the list? I would say I would agree that it's low, that it's probably maybe 80. Okay. Matt, do you think it's – where do you think it's at? I think it's higher than that. Give it it middle of the range, 50s. Okay. Matt would be closest uh, on the list at number 64. So, so far, uh, the episodes we've done were pretty close. So let's talk about some of the episodes we got upcoming. We're right about to do Seven Samurai. On the list or not on the list? Oh, it's on the list. Chris? I'm not sure because it's a foreign film, so it, um, that one I could go either way. I'm going to say no. Lori? I, I'm going to say yes because I think I understand that it influenced a lot of films. Okay. So I'm going to say yes. Yes, on the list, number 17. Yeah. High, high on the list. 17? Yeah. Man, Singing in the Rain beat out Seven Samurais? Uh, just barely. It's 16 and 17 right there next mm-hmm. to each other. So t- just talking about some of the upcoming episodes we got, Matt's next pick, which is our next episode after this, House of Flying Daggers. On the list? Not on the list. That can't be on the list. <laughs> Very confident endorsement for your film. That, it just, that, just, that doesn't seem like an Entertainment Weekly kind of top 100 movie to me, I guess. Trust me, there are films on here that I am shocked are on the list. So, Lori? I'm going to go with not on the list. Chris? It shouldn't be. It better not be. <laughs> it is not on the list. Chris's next pick, uh, La Aventura. Uh, on the list or not on the list? I think that one's on the list. It was a pretty influential director. Okay, Lori? Well, I can't say the title, so I'm going to say not on the list. Okay, Matt? I, I don't know anything about that movie. Okay. <laughs> just, you just know that we're going to review it in a few weeks. That's so. right. Wait, you're telling me you haven't seen the movie yet? Yeah, I, I haven't seen that one. Oh. Uh, is, it is on the list uh, at number really? seven. Number 70. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, just to finish the, the go around of a new uh, or episode, or no, sorry, out there will be one for me after this. Uh, Lori's next pick uh, will come out in October. She's got a horror film. She's picked Night of the Living Dead as her horror film. On the list or not on the list? Possibly. I mean, it's definitely on the horror film list. I'm going to say yes, but hi, maybe, you know, 90s. Matt? I- I'm going to guess it's on the list. Okay. And I, 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 w- I don't know where they'd put it. Chris? No, I'm going to say no, just because everybody said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough reason at all. It is on the list, which shocked yeah. the hell out of me. So, uh, number 79. So, Ooh. Yeah, I, I, would never have, I never would have thought that film would have been on the top 100 films of all time. And uh, my next pick after Seven Samurai is uh, also going to be in October, so it's another... A horror film. I pick Psycho. Uh, who thinks Psycho is on the list? Without a doubt. Yeah, that's got to be on the list. It's got to be high on the list. I would assume it is. Yeah. Uh, number five. Yay! Uh, so, mm, that uh, sounds right. So basically in our first, uh, that's 12 episodes, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of the films um, that we've reviewed are actually on Entertainment Weekly, so we're in the ballpark here. We're we are talking about the uh, a lot of the films that uh, that uh, generally are considered very good, and the four that haven't 
Invasion of the Body Snatchers, House of Flying Daggers, um, Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and which one am I forgetting? McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller um, have all had their their accolades for themselves as well. That you know, but probably within the the top two hundred, if not the top one hundred. So, what is so the Chris- top five? <laughs> Number five was Psycho. Um, I think was well warranted. Number four, Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, really? Which I do not think is a top five film. Number three, Casablanca, which I think is proper, uh, properly in place. Uh, number two, The Godfather, uh, the first one. And number one, of course, is Citizen Kane. All right. <clears throat> so let's get through this uh, slandering of uh, Japanese uh, samurai names, shall we? Since I have the summary for this week, and I'm going to screw this up. Can you tell me a story? Our film begins as a gang of marauding bandits rides up to a small mountain farming village. However, before the bandits can ride into their town, their chief recognizes they have ransacked this village before. He decides to pass on their attack and come back after the village has completed its harvest in a couple of months. Unbeknownst to the bandits, a villager overhears this and reports to the village elder. The elder decides they should hire some samurai to defend the village and kill the bandits. Since they have nothing to offer but food, the elder tells them to find hungry samurai. A group of men go to the city, but find that no samurai want to work for mere food. Then they encounter a wizard-like samurai with a stylish haircut who appears to have lived out on the dune sea by the name of Kambai. Kambai impresses them when he rescues a young boy taken hostage by a thief. Another young samurai, Katsushiro, also sees the rescue and asks the elder samurai if he may become his disciple. Kanbai insists that he walk with him as a friend and agrees to help the farmers. With Katsushiro's assistance, Kanbai recruits four more ronin. Glorabai Katayama, who is the clever and good-natured samurai. Haihachi, a good-humored samurai with mediocre swordsmanship. Shish Hiroshi, an old friend of Kanbai's. And Kuso a quiet master swordsman that you can imagine being played by James Coburn in a Western a few years later. The six samurai begin the journey to the mountain town and are followed by Kukuchio, a jokester samurai who is the built-in comedy relief of the film. Kukuchio had previously been rejected for the mission by Kambai, but now the wise old samurai sees the young samurai as useful. When the samurai arrive, the villagers cower in their homes, fearful of their hired saviors. The samurai feel insulted by their cold and welcoming reception. Suddenly, the village alarm is raised, and the villagers, fearing that the bandits have returned, charge out of their homes and beg the samurai to protect them. Kukuchio, who raised the false alarm, rebukes the villagers for their poor behavior. The samurai accept him, bringing their number to an, e- to an even seven. I guess not e- really even, but... As the long film progresses, the samurai and the villagers slowly come to trust each other. However, when the samurai discover that the villagers have murdered and robbed fleeing samurai in the past, they become angry. Kukuchio chastises his comrades for ignoring the hardships that the villagers have, have, have had to overcome to survive, including harassment from the warrior class and bandits. This reveals his origins as a farmer's son to come by. The anger the young samurai feel turns to shame. The samurai and the villagers construct fortifications and train the farmers for battle. Katsuchiro, the youngest samurai, begins a relationship with Shino, the daughter of a villager who has been forced to masquerade as a boy by her father to protect her from the supposedly lustful samurai. Katsuchiro and Shino keep their relationship secret from both Shino's father and the other samurai. However, the ever-watchful Katsuzo discovers their secret but keeps the secret for Katsuchiro. Eventually, the bandits return in the form of three scouts. Two of the scouts are quickly dispatched, but one of the scouts is captured and reveals the location of the bandit camp. Three of the samurai, guided by a villager named Rikishi, go to the camp to conduct a preemptive strike. The samurai set fire to one of the bandits' strongholds. As the bandits run out of the burning building, the samurai cut them down. When a woman emerges from the bandits' burning house, she sees Rikishi and runs back inside to perish in the flames. Rikishi re- reveals that that was his wife, who had been kidnapped and raped by the bandits. One of the samurai, Haihachi, is killed in the attack. Soon the bandits attack the village, but are confused by the improvements and the barriers created for the village. The bandits suffer heavy losses while trying to navigate the few obstacles. However, the bandits have a huge advantage in the form of three muskets. The silent Kyuso undertakes a solo mission and returns with a musket. However, the inexperienced Kikishio abandons his post to get another musket. 
In the process, he leaves his contingent of villagers leaderless. Although he succeeds, the bandits attack his post, overwhelming and killing some of the villagers. Kambai is forced to send reinforcements, leaving the main post under man when the bandit chief leads a charge against his, this position. Although they are repelled, Gorabai and Yohi are lost in the battle. Kambai, who is now down several villagers and three samurai, develops a new strategy to allow one bandit to enter through the gap in the fortifications, block the rest with a wall of spears, and kill the lone bandit. This succeeds several times. On the second night of the bandit siege, Kambai instructs everyone to prepare for a final, decisive battle. However, in the midst of planning, Shino's father discover, discovers his daughter's secret relationship with Katsushiro and beats Shino. Katsushiro hangs his head in shame while the rest of the samurai and the villagers look on. As it begins to rain, everyone goes back to their posts. When the morning breaks, Kambai orders his forces to allow the remaining bandits in. Most of the attackers are killed, but the leader takes refuge in a hut where the women and children are hiding. And what is portrayed as a dishonorable act, he shoots Kayuso from a hut, killing him. A despondent Katsushiro seeks to avenge his hero, but an enraged Kikuchio charges ahead of him, only to be shot himself. Kikuchiro kills the bandit chief before dying. Kambai and Shishiroshi sadly observe, we've survived once again. Afterward, the three surviving samurai watch the villagers happily planting the next crop. They reflect on the relationship between the warrior and the farming class. Though they have won the battle, they have lost their friends with little to show for it. Again, we are defeated, Kambai muses. The winners are those farmers, not us. And that is Seven Samurai. Yay! God, I'm not going <laughs> to... I don't think I'll ever pick a foreign film ever again. So. <laughs> Films are not made in a vacuum. Um, they are influenced by the times that the, the, the filmmakers live in. And we look back at those uh, news items and things that were going on in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Dun, da, dun, dun. Oh. 1954. The first issue of Sports Illustrated was published. Um, a hydrogen bomb test was conducted on the Pacific Island of Bikini Atoll. Sorry, I got to go back. Was that the swimsuit episode issue that year, or was there something else? I don't follow the swimsuit episode. <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's only one issue of Sports Illustrated I generally read per year, and that's it. So. <laughs> For the articles, of course. Senator Joseph McCarthy's communist witch hunt, which began about 1950, was finally stopped. Many careers and lives were destroyed. The Supreme Court ruled in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education that segregated public schools were unconstitutional. Ellis Island in New York City closed as an immigration entry point. And they reopened it in Nogales, Arizona. <laughs> Not officially. It's all under the table. <clears throat> the words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance officially. <laughs> Creating 50 more years of legal problems. The Tonight Show premiered with Steve Allen hosting. Elvis Presley, the king, recorded his first demo for Sun Records or Sun Studios. And in 1954, American families first consumed TV dinners. Popular songs at the time were Rock Around the Clock, which was also the theme to Happy Days, Shaboom, Earth Angel, Good Night Sweetheart. And in 1954, if you went to a movie theater to watch a movie such as Seven Samurai, White Christmas, or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, you would have paid 70 cents per ticket. What about in 3D? Was it, ten, was it a full dollar at that point in time? or? I'll have to look that up and get back to you. <laughs> All right. As we always do, we usually start by looking at the the casting of the film. And in this particular film, I thought there were two uh, main characters or main um, actors that I think kind of carried the film. One is uh, Toshiro Mifune, who played uh, Kukuchiro, um, kind of the uh, clownish samurai who was comes from humble beginnings as a kind of a farmer's son. And then uh, Takashi Shimura, who played uh, Kambai, who's the, the wise leader of the Seven Samurai. I thought those were the two kind of the most important uh, characters in the film. Chris, what did you think of uh, these two particular characters? 
I like Kambai a lot. Uh, I thought he was a, a good leader for the group, uh, you know, very sensible, knowledgeable, that was able to put um, put Wait, together a team. And I think someone's order's up. I'm not sure. Yeah, did you hear that? <laughs> um, so I thought uh, he was a great person for for the leader of the group. A very traditional, well, I guess, since this was the first group type action film that he's kind of the model for things to come. But I think he was a, a perfect beginning to this. And then um, Toshiro, I didn't care for his character a whole lot, but uh, he was uh, a pretty solid uh, foil to the leader of the group. You didn't like his character, but do you, I, I think he kind of had, he's an entry point for the audience is that he, first yes, of, he is the most, I think he's the most relatable because he kind of, he um, was someone who crossed both, I don't know, uh, classes of people in that film since he was trying to be part of the warrior group, but he was from the common peasant group originally. So he definitely was the most relatable. Well, I, I thought, you know, the Kambai character, I thought he was great. I thought it was well played, and I, I liked the way it provided that stability to the movie i thought that the the kiku chido character though was really the the soul of the film um i th- i thought um that was where most of the not only the interesting things happened in the movie but i just thought that's really where the the movie wanted us to go to, to dwell um the the way that he kind of overcame his fear as a farmer you know we're treated with all these afraid farmers throughout the movie and he's the one that had already kind of overcome that fear and was willing to stand up. And I think that's was really what the movie was about, largely. I'm going to come back to him later in my in my portion, but I love that character. Lori? I didn't have any problem with any of the characters. I, I thought they were all really interesting and, and well acted. Yeah, I was surprised how much I enjoyed this movie. You know, I liked Kanbai, and, you know, the Kurosawa films are often, uh, you know, cited specifically the Hidden Fortress as a, a, a source material for the Star Wars films, which is kind of, you know, my bread and butter when I was a kid. And when I see Kanbai, I see Obi-Wan Kenobi is what I see is this kind of older, wiser, lead, you know, kind of stoic character who seems to know what everyone needs to do. And it, even... He he sees something in you know, the Kikuchiro uh, character that is uh, redeemable, and that's why it allows him to come along, even though he he comes off as the is inexperienced. He's not even really a samurai. Is perceived by you know what he wears and the hairstyle. I watched one of the making of documentaries where they talk about his character as a samurai carry two swords, and their swords are they're very reverent to their swords. And the way he carries a sword, like sometimes kind of slung over his back with his arms, you know, on each end of it, almost like he's trying to bend it. Is It's not respectful of the sword, and he only has one sword, and samurai carry two swords, and then his hairstyle. that Everything about him says he's not really a samurai. You know, he's faking at being a samurai, and uh, they say he could be important to this. Now, what about foreign films in general? I mean, uh, this is the first foreign film that we've actually reviewed and obviously films don't directly translate there has to be a translation of it and sometimes something is lost in the translation do you think foreign films suffer from that or is the, is the meaning of the film or the general purpose of the film still there and maybe not this one but in, in films and foreign films in general i think uh that it just depends for each film um when when you say that i actually thought back to when i was a little kid watching Robotech, which was Japanese animation of the day that uh, I, I don't even think that the original Japanese storyline was anything close to what came out in America, or maybe it was, but they just kind of wrote their own. So, you know, there can be a lot of artistic license when uh, translating from one language to another, if uh, if that's the intent. But I don't think that was the intent for this film. And I, to me, um, I don't I can't imagine it losing a whole lot of meaning through translation from Japanese to English because it was still, I mean, they put a lot in this movie, but it was still a pretty well-rounded uh, storyline. With And I think they definitely got a, 
a different type meaning out of this movie than we in America did because I'm sure there's a lot of tradition and ceremonials things that just do not translate uh, when you're when you're doing uh, Japanese to English language. I mean, just visually, you know, the nonverbal communication. So, I mean, I just Patrick because the thing about the samurai, I didn't know all that stuff mm-hmm. about the two swords. So definitely. Without a doubt, at three hours and 20 minutes, there's got to be some deeper meaning and hidden symbolism in this. And usually we turn to Chris to point out some of those deeper meanings and hidden symbolism. So what are, what are we seeing or what we're not seeing in this film? I didn't see anything in this film. No, oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that and singing, you compare this to Singing in the Rain, where you said there was no symbolism. We're, yeah, this is just a fun-loving, uh, what you see is what you get sort of movie. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the things that I noticed about hidden or deeper meanings was there seemed to be a battle of the classes in this movie between the the samurai class and the lowly peasant class. Clearly, the samurai had to depend on the working class for their food and sustenance for this film, but they uh, didn't see them as equals where the the farmers uh, feared the samurai for – what if for you know possibly coming in raping their women and uh there was they were shown to have actually killed the samurai with uh that scene how do you say his name Kukachio? yeah where he found all these these weapons and, and such and so clearly there was animosity between these villagers and the the first time the the samurai come to the village it, clearly they're scared for legitimate reasons so there was throughout this whole film, I felt there was a, a huge battle between the classes, yet uh, both needed each other for survival. Also, one of the things I saw was the fighting for the good of the people, and not for one lord, which goes, I guess, against the way of the samurai in that they're fighting. They're fighting for people where they're getting paid, paid sometimes a little bit of food, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. And and samurai usually fought for a particular lord. That was what they did if they were. If they didn't have a lord, they were ronin and they were, you know, leaderless samurai at that point in time. And that I think is goes against the kind of the code of the samurai at the time, is you're doing it for not what the individual or the infrastructure, but for the good of all people. And that was even reflected at the end of the movie with Kambe uh, saying uh, that the people. What did he say? Something like that the people won or the people were the victors today? They're the winners. They're the winners, yeah. And I think that's a reflection of what you just said. Well, let me say this. I do know that there was a lot of uh, symbolism in this movie that is probably going to be lost on American audiences with no knowledge of the samurai code or the Japanese culture. I feel like everything from the way the the samurai drew their sword to the way they talked, the way they acted – was all very symbolic of how they were training. Like, I don't know how, how strictly traditional they, they stuck to the code. If there were maybe samurai of the day who saw the film were like, no, you know, kind of how maybe doctors would see uh, TV doctors and critique uh, what is real and what is not. But I do think there was a lot of symbolism that was lost on me just through not knowing Japanese culture. Okay. So what you're saying is today samurai would say that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, yesterday samurai would say the same thing too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, what about your moral universe portion <clears throat> problem? What is the moral problem in this, this little universe? You know, my thoughts on the film went almost exactly where, where Chris is, uh, where I saw the film and, and I mentioned earlier how I really liked uh, Kiku Chido as the, I feel like kind of the heart and soul of the movie because he's this farmer who overcomes his or, or comes from, from a farming family, I guess you could say, who experiences all those things of – he talks about where they, they had been um, uh, killed by the samurai and they learn to be sneaky. They're hiding food. They're planting in the mountains and doing all these things just to survive. And the farmers in the, the film, they're also afraid. And here he's the one who kind of became less of a farmer and more of a samurai. And at the same time, we have the samurai who are risking everything for very little, you know, payment. And so I, I think generally we're we're getting this story about people of diverging interests who are coming together and pursuing a, a more a more just situation by these these bandits who are just out there to, to rob and steal. 
And so I, I think the movie really, really gives us that that lesson of interdependence among among different types of people. And uh, something I was noticing about the morals is um, I don't think you could talk about him in this film without mentioning. Uh, I say Kiyuzo. Is that his name? The, the, the kind of silent the, but very skilled samurai. The, the master swordsman. Yeah. He embodied, um, in my opinion, what what every noble uh, samurai would aspire to be. He seemed to be the pinnacle of of the samurai, and um, I, I found it very interesting that um, he was looked up to by uh, what is it, Katsushiro? But Katsushiro, in many ways, was immoral even though he was the youngest because he's the one who actually um, had an affair with one of the villagers which was one of their greatest underlying fears you know so um, I noticed that there was um, uh, an interesting comparison between the most noble and the most I don't I wouldn't really call them unnoble but there was definitely a moral lesson that they were trying to say uh, he, he was also the one too where they kind of treat him like a child or mm-hmm. even, you know, you had Kiku Chido who was reckless and not a samurai, but at least he was capable of taking charge of his own little area. And, you know, he was mm-hmm. he was a fighter that that young guy was almost just it, it was almost like he was receiving the samurai's charity as much as as much as the farmers were just for yeah. being there. Well, and also about the, the master swordsman, you know, I, I, I saw his character as kind of symbolic of the samurai in general in their time is that he was, he's this very skilled, very quiet, noble. He, he does, he does these amazing things and in, in his ability, that, but he's cut down by the, the modern warfare. He's cut down by a rifle shot, you know, from a hidden, for, you know, a hidden fortress or a hidden site from, and almost that, you know, symbolically, kind of, this is the ultimately going to be the end of the samurai. Is they they can't fight bullets, you know, and the kind of the end of their ways. Yeah, he definitely represents uh, a changing of the guard through his death. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the kind of the parallels between the samurai films, a J- a Japanese samurai films, and the American Western films. And reading up on the film, I came across a quote from the director Akira Kurosawa when he was he was kind of, kind of talking about westerns and let me just read it here good westerns are liked by everyone since humans are weak they want to see good people and great heroes westerns have been done over and over again and in the process a kind of grammar has evolved and i have learned from this grammar of the western and i thought it was an interesting quote considering that ultimately three of his films are, are converted into Western films directly converted into Western films. There's Seven Samurai, obviously becomes a mag- magnificent Seven, um, and that later actually becomes a Bug's Life, if you can believe that. Uh, really? <laughs> so you go back and watch it. Uh, <laughs> Yohimbo, um, also probably going to be a samurai film that we review, come, becomes a fistful of dollars with Clint Eastwood, and uh, Rashomon, uh, a good chance of being in the top 100, uh, is later made into a film called The Outrage, which is actually one I have not seen, but I've heard is terrible, or I read is terrible. But what do you think about that? That, you know, kind of, we, we talked, we've already talked about Westerns with two of our films, but this being essentially the Japanese Western and how, how, how it translates culturally. I just, some themes are just timeless and trans, transcend all cultures. And uh, the themes of a Western are frontier justice versus uh, civilized justice and um, the wild versus the, the tamed. And I think they just will always translate well. And that's what I've noticed between uh, the, the Westerns we've seen and between this one. It is definitely uh, – there's a lot of parallels that I think they're just – they trans, transcend no – they transcend all languages. So, is your—I mean—is your question what genre is this film? Well, no. I mean, that, I mean, what do you what do you think of that idea that uh, because it's so uniquely that, that specifically this director Kurosawa, based off his observation of Western films, uh, he grew up watching American films that he was able to kind of take that grammar and apply it to something that was culturally unique to his his culture. And yet it was and still in a way that can be they could take that take the samurai out of it and put a gunslinger in it and still make an effective and, you know, classic film. Oh, I think he, he pulled that off remarkably well. 
this this feels kind of like a western to me. You know, so much so that I, you know, I I saw the Magnificent Seven before I saw this movie, and the, you know the and the plot being almost identical, if I'm not mistaken, um, I thought it worked just as well as a western, and I really like I really like the the setting of of the Seven Samurai. Um, I would agree that they are universal themes. It translated well. I have not seen the Magnificent Seven. How can you not have seen Magnificent Seven? I haven't seen it either. <laughs> I have I have never gravitated toward westerns. <laughs> what about Paint Your Wagon? That's a western and a musical. Come on. I saw that. <laughs> well, here's an easy one. Uh, this is typically cla- uh, classified or ca- not classified, categorized as a samurai film because of the genre. Is we classify things as westerns. This is a samurai film. If you were to put it in a different category. What's what's its subcategory? Drama, action, western. I mean, where would you put it? See, I don't, I don't think this is an action movie. T- talking about the length of the movie, see, I, I knew what I was getting into when I started watching the movie. I knew how the movie would go, plot wise, and I kept waiting for this fight to happen a lot sooner. And, and the, re- the the you know, in a three and a half hour movie, this big battle we've been building up to, it doesn't happen for what, you know, three hours, two hours, forty five minutes. Mm-hmm. And so I, in hindsight, I, I really thought this was a movie so much more about, you know, the farmers and the samurai, how the farmers deal with their fear, how the samurai learn to, to do their business a little differently. And it was w- way more about the changes that happen in these characters than it was a reason to watch people slash each other or anything like that. So I, I felt like it was much more of a character drama than it was an action movie. I would almost consider it a historical or based on a true story sort of situation almost like shakespeare in his uh his histories where you take real situations and make a drama out of it i mean other than the the end of the the movie the the big action battle scene that is kind of uh from what little i know about japanese culture you know they had to worry about lawlessness back in uh, back in the day so this to me was more of a just as much as a historical piece as it was a modern film I would agree. My first impression was that it was a historical film. I mean, I would say samurai movie slash historical. Hmm. You know, I agree with Matt that I think it's more drama that, you know, three hours and 27 minutes, no one can accuse this film of being uh, being uh, a quick action film. But I think the character development is, is what makes this film as good as it is. The richness of it is that, you know, you are allowed to develop with the characters. So... Let's talk about the ending of the film. Uh, one, Chris wanted to talk about it. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's almost very somber that Kanbai and Shishiroshi at the end of the film look like they lost the battle, even though, you know, they ended up winning. They did lose many of the members of their group. Is your interpretation that they're disappointed in their victory? Um, based on some of the things they say, maybe this time we die, um, as they say earlier in the film, almost like they're looking forward to it. We've survived once again, uh, and again we are defeated. I mean, is you know something I tried to talk about a little bit earlier? But is there honor? Do they perceive honor in death? I think death. absolutely. Uh, Lori, do you want to go ahead? You start to talk. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I w- I was just going to say definitely. What little I know of Japanese culture, I I think of you know kamikaze pilots. Um, they believe it's better to. I think that they believe it's better to die than to lose. Yeah, but they won and they seem disappointed. I I think that uh, his career is seen as a failure as a samurai if he doesn't die in battle. When I think Katsushiro um, first was trying to become his student, didn't Kambe say something like he wasn't a very good in, um, in his battles? And, Originally, at the beginning of the film, I thought that he meant, you know, uh, that the side he was on always lost. But my opinion by the end of the film was that the side he was on always won and he always survived. I think, I don't know about Sishiroi, his, his uh, lieutenant. Sishiroshi? Um, I, I don't know if he had the, the wish to die in battle, but I really do think that Kambai really wanted to die saving people. The, the way he recklessly went after that. Uh, guy at the beginning of the film to uh, not dying in battle and compare that to um, uh, cause, you know, what is his name the 
the the guy who died at the hands of the gun, the master swordsman, you know, he died honorably. He lived honorably. I, I think his words at the very end where we survived again, again, we are defeated the, the people of one. Uh, I think he was very disappointed that he did not die in battle, but he, so uh, <laughs> go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just think that he was truly disappointed that he didn't die in battle and his career is a, you can win as many as you want, but if you don't die saving, dying is part of your duty as a samurai, I believe is what they feel. So you don't, you think it was the honor of, of dying in battle? Yes. Matt? I don't know. I, I feel like I don't have the information to, to read the ending of this movie properly. I, like, I feel like it's probably something a Japanese audience would get better than, than I do. But the way I, the way I watched it at the time was I, I felt like their victory was so costly to the samurai I, I kind of interpreted his statement that they won to be about how they had, you know, overcome that fear and also about the, the amount of effort they had put in and how much the farmers had changed from the time the samurai arrived until the time that they had defeated these bandits. Hmm. And in essence, the samurai are no longer needed. Right. You know, so the samurai lose. And what, what good is a, a, a samurai who doesn't have a purpose in life? Yeah, what about the length of the film? Specifically, uh, this question goes to Chris because I know he hates long films. I found two quotes when I was looking up film critics' quotes on this uh, about this film. And one uh, it was an interesting quote from Kenneth Turin uh, from the Los Angeles Times where he describes uh, Kurosawa's uh, direction of this film. He said, Confident in his powers and not in any kind of rush, Kurosawa proceeds like a master chef, allowing his ingredients to simmer and become tastier and tastier and tastier still. And then there was another film critic, Bosley Crowther, from the New York Times, who said that this film is it is much too long for comfort or for the story it has to tell. Uh, at three hours and 27 minutes, Chris, is this good film? I mean, does the length serve its purpose? Uh, yeah, I do. I actually agree with Kenneth Turin's uh, quote. Um, I, I don't like long movies like this. But this was a phenomenally good movie, I thought. So if you were to ask me, well, okay, it's too long. What should you cut out? I think you'd be very hard-pressed to take anything out and still it'd be a solid story. So unfortunately, I think this movie did have to be three hours and 27 minutes, even though I hate sitting there for that long. <laughs> Laurie, what did you think of the length? Today must be Laurie agrees with Christy because <laughs> I, I don't know what you would take out. It was long, but I I couldn't imagine taking anything out. I didn't feel any of it was gratuitous or or too long. It it all added to the story. Matt, I I loved the length and pacing of this movie. I don't dislike long movies either. I usually, you know I dislike movies that are too long. And at, at three and a half hours, this this was not too long. And I thought you needed that amount of time to develop a, a, the arc of these characters this this much and have this many characters meaningfully portrayed so i thought it was very well done well and i agree with matt on that is that you have seven samurai but then you also have some of the individual members of the village that the arc that they have to overcome through this and the fact that you don't even get to see the seven samurai until an hour into this film kind of shows the storyline that must happen you know that the, this development of these characters and how they come together is you see where they're at before and where they're at at the end of the film and see their full character arc so i agree that i i always forget that this film is that long every time i sit down and watch it but when i, I get done with it i'm always like you know i what would i take out i wouldn't take anything out when a movie or a podcast for that matter <laughs> is too long you always know what can come out right Let's talk about the film's legacy. Nominated for two Academy Awards, uh, Best Art Direction, which lost to Somebody Up There Likes Me, uh, Best Costume Designer, for, uh, lost to the Solid Gold Cadillac, not nominated for Best Foreign Film. How does that happen? Was it, and it wasn't nominated for Best Picture? It was not nominated for Best Picture either. Wow. It, does it surprise you? I mean, that this didn't get the kind of accolades uh, in, in its time? Those foreign yes. films must have been pretty solid that year. Well, I mean, for a foreign it would film, have to be. Yeah, well, the foreign film to be 
to get nominated in this day and age, if a foreign film was nominated for best art direction, best costume design, that something is special about that film. But then to to not have been nominated for best foreign film, I almost almost see as a travesty. Let alone best not being nominated mm-hmm. for best picture. But I could see that to a certain extent because the kind of the somewhat prejudice of we nominate English language films, or maybe prejudice. That- Prejudice against Japanese at the time. Not, yeah, that not too far was, off from, from World, World War II. II. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's something I hadn't thought about. That that potentially that we're not going to nominate that film because of where it came from. I hadn't thought about that. They already had problems as being labeled as communist in Hollywood back then. So maybe they just couldn't come out in the open and say, "Hey, we mm-hmm. like this Japanese story." Well, let's look at some of the the kind of rankings of the film today. Uh, It seems to be, by many other critics and film websites, recognized as a classic to this day. It's the highest rated, excuse me, highest reviewed action adventure film on Rotten Tomatoes, 100% by critics. 100% critics uh, like this film on Rotten Tomatoes. 96% audience. Number two on Rotten Tomatoes top 100 foreign films. Voted number three by Sight and Sound Critics Poll of Greatest Films in 1982, uh, which they did again in 1992. It ranked number 10, and they did in 2002 and ranked it number nine. So floating in the top 10 at all times in that in that magazine. Uh, number one on Empire Magazine's 100 Best Films of World Cinema. Best Japanese Film Ever by 1979's Kinema, Kinema Jupo Critics Poll. Highest ranked Asian film on IMDb's top 250 films movies list, number 17. Uh, voted number one in audience poll conducted by Movie Mail in 2000. And uh, we've already talked about Entertainment Weekly ranking at number 17 in their most current edition. I believe they had it ranked number 12 the last time they did a top 100. Is, is, it, well deser- is it deserved? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with any of those rankings, to be honest with you. This, I hadn't seen this film before, but this is definitely an extremely solid movie. Yeah, it's it's up there. Do you think the film's legacy suffers at all from being a foreign film or the fact that it was in black and white in an era where color films were starting to come around? I almost feel like the foreignness and and the black and white add to the film. You know how Spielberg did Schindler's List? Uh-huh in black and white. I almost feel that that adds something to the film. But then I am partial to black and white movies. That's true. I I can't imagine it would. I mean, it's hard to say, but I don't I don't think they took away anything from the the movies. And as far as them now, I don't wouldn't have liked this movie any better in color. Has it been colorized? No, has not. Um, Has it been made into 3D and they're charging 15 bucks to get in <laughs> in IMAX? Uh, not yet. Probably next year. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's let's close this up. Uh, we'll start with Lori uh, this time. Would you put this in your hundred greatest films of all time? I would. Oh, I, I hear. I think we got another unanimous ruling on this one. I got a feeling. So, <laughs> you would really. That surprises me a little bit. I was surprised myself how <laughs> much I enjoyed it. <laughs> It was a good movie. Matt? Yeah. I put it in my top 100. I put it in my top 20, maybe 15. I, I thought this was a fantastic movie. I really liked it, and I've thought about it a lot. Did, had, now, had you – Lori, we'll go back to Lori. Lori, had you seen this before? Seeing this? I had not. And Matt, had you seen this before? No. No, oh. I'd only seen The Magnificent Seven. Okay. Okay, cool. So two first impressions, and you put it uh, – you put it in your top 20. You put it in your top 100. Chris? Yeah, I hadn't seen this film before uh, this podcast, and I was, to be honest with you, I saw the movie time, and I was dreading to watch it. I I just didn't want to do it, but I uh, was uh, really happy I did. It is definitely in my top 100. I think that it's uh, – I don't – I'm not going to say that I, I'd put it in my top 10, but I definitely would put this in my top 15 of all oh, time. Wow, top 15. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I picked it, so it's in my top 100 hands down. I agree with Matt. I probably would put it in my top 20. I think uh, Entertainment Weekly probably has it right someplace in the, the late teens. I watched this on a whim, not even really knowing that it was the the story for Magnificent Seven, because I'd seen that years before, and then recognizing it from, from the get-go of uh, th- that common plot line that's been used in many things now. But uh, I... 
I watched it all in one evening uh, on a rainy Friday night. I remember that specifically and just fell in love with this film. I was so uh, taken with the, the storytelling and the character development that Kurosawa did with all the characters that three hours and 27 minutes, but he doesn't waste a moment. I mean, there's nothing in there that is just fluff. It's, it's all specifically choreographed to push the characters along and give them each their time and um, that allows them to kind of flourish the characters that you come to to appreciate because of it. So, yeah, it's in my top 100. This one bumped Ernest Goes to Camp to number 16. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my mom cried when we watched that movie as a kid. If you can believe it. Because, we still make fun of her to this day. Cause you Out made, of pain. Because you made her watch it? or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That does it for this week's review of this of Seven Samurai. Uh, thanks once again for joining us and listening in on our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our, our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on, on, on upcoming podcasts. And you can be like uh, David M. Johnson, Eddie Havina, and Chris Despain, who recently recently liked us on Facebook and are now up to date on everything that is Movie House Memories. Additionally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you downloaded us off iTunes, make sure to rate our podcast while you're on iTunes. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from fans of the show. And if you are indeed one of those fans of the show, help us keep it going. If you're considering making a purchase through Amazon.com, like I do nearly on a daily basis lately, it seems, enter the, enter the Amazon site through our website at moviehousememories.com. Once on our site, simply click on one of the many Amazon banners on, the page, on any page to enter Amazon.com. Once there, just make your purchase as you would any other transaction, and that is it portion of your purchase will go to support the upkeep of movie house memories it doesn't cost you a penny more to do it but does help us keep help us pay the normal bills that are associated with operating a website and podcast until next time i'm patrick i'm Lori. i'm matt i'm chris and we'll see you next time at our house This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.